Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tobias Ostrander, and I am the Chief Curator and Deputy Director of, for Curatorial Affairs here at the Paris Art Museum Miami. Um, I'm very excited to have my friend and colleague here, Pablo Leon de la Barra, uh, to, to speak about his recent practice, or several projects. But um, this is uh, the, the kind of keynote, uh, he's the keynote speaker um, that's kind of culminating two days of professional workshops that we've been having here um, at PAM, uh, a project uh, annual conference called Tilting Access um, that began last year in the Bahamas and is being hosted by us this, oh, Barbados, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Annalie. <laughs> at Fresh Milk in, in uh, Barbados. And, um, and, and it has brought together this year um, 73 professionals um, working in the Caribbean or working with the Caribbean. And uh, it's been two days of intense um, com um, conversations and networking and learning from one another. So it's, um, this is a really exciting time for the museum and, uh, and it's a project that will continue um, uh, into the future. So um, I wanna introduce Pablo just briefly. Um, Pablo Leon de la Barra um, is the Guggenheim UBS uh, MAP Latin American curator at the, the Guggenheim Museum in New York, and he's the director of the Casa uh, Franca Brasil in Rio de Janeiro. He was born in Mexico City um, and earned a PhD in, in histories and theories from the Architectural Association in London. He's curated or co-curated more than a dozen exhibitions during the last decade at I institutions including the David Roberts Art Foundation, um, uh, in the Kunsthalle Zurich, Apex Art and Art in General in New York, Casa Lu Luis Barragan, uh, Casa del Lago, and Museo Tamayo, all in Mexico City, among many others. He is also the co-founder of the Novo Museo Tropical, uh, Tropi uh, Tropical and was the curator of the first um, biennial trop Tropical in San Juan in 2011. Leon de la, de la Barra serves as the, on the advisory committee of, of the Cisneros uh, Frontales Art Foundation here in Miami and, uh, and the Fundacion Luis Barragan in Mexico. He's going to speak today. He's going to share um, certain approaches. He's going to talk about some of his recent projects um, and think about various approaches to curating that um, could apply to the Caribbean and beyond. Um, and also the idea of um, connecting tropics and tropicalismos. And so uh, please join me in welcoming Pablo Leon de la Barra. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, uh, Tilting Axis. Uh, when Tobias invited me, he, he was very insistent that, uh, that I should come. And at the beginning, I was like, um, are you sure, Tobias? Uh, what do you want me to talk about? Uh, what's my experience in the Caribbean? But then I realized that, uh, that I've, I've been working constantly for the last 12 years, Spanish-speaking Caribbean, and that there's, uh, there's lots to share. Um, I've been very happy these uh, this days being here, especially on hearing the, the multiplicity of voices that exist in the region and, uh, and which are actually mapping uh, a new visibility to it. So, so very happy to, uh, to be part of this and at least to contribute my own, uh, my own uh, knowledge uh, to, to, this, to this group and, uh, and to the, all the other friends who are here uh, today. I'm going to show a series of uh, different projects, which in a way uh, will, will help us and will help me understand uh, not only what I'm doing, but, uh, but ways of, of acting uh, which, uh, which might make sense in, uh, in our context, uh, context where uh, sometimes uh, there's no budget to do exhibitions or where institutions are uh, fragile. So, um, so really, it's it's more about sharing my experience and uh, and raising some uh, some questions. Let me check uh, the time. It's uh, just to be sure that uh, that I don't run out of time. As there's lots of stuff, so uh, so I'll put my timer here and uh, and I'll stop when it's 45 minutes. So that's it. And I'm going to start with this uh, with this first project that I did in 2002 in Puerto Rico, El Museo del Cerro, invited to this uh, 
kind of biennial that was organized by uh, Michel Marsouache at the time. It was a second of these, uh, of these biennials. And the idea it was that each one of the invited participants would, uh, would develop projects on uh, different sites on the islands. So I was invited to do a project in uh, El Cerro del Naranjito, uh, a village, uh, uh, a, small, a small city in the, um, about an hour from uh, San Juan. And uh, this, you see in the photo, you see, you see El Cerro, and that's before artist uh, Chemi Rosado developed a project there for a whole year during 2002, where basically he worked with the community in painting the houses uh, green. So uh, the timer was not working, so I don't know. What was. <laughs> Let's save this one. So, um, so anyway, what could could seem as a as a kind of giant painting or, or site painting or or piece of land art was really a way of. Uh, of working with the local community, of enabling participation, of using art as an excuse to go beyond art. And this is a context uh, where I was, uh, let's say, parachute at the time. I will contest also, I mean, in the past days, we were talking a lot about the idea of parachuting curators and artists. Um, maybe, maybe at this time I was parachuting, but, but the beginning of a parachuting really then becomes in relationships with places. And I also think that as part of my practices, as, as my, of my curatorial practice, I insist on returning to places and continuing working with artists, but also on creating relationships between these different places where one, uh, where, 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 where one works. So this is the main square of, um, of El Cerro del Naranjito, uh, a basketball court. As you see, there's a, there's a police, uh, patrol there, so this is the normal everyday scenario that, that existed in the town, uh, a place where, 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 which also subsisted of, uh, of the selling of uh, illegal uh, substances. And, uh, and this is where Chemi had been working already for a year. So really it was possible to, uh, to work there because, because Chemi and, uh, and, the, and the group of people around Michi and the, and the, and the Bienal had already done the, the previous work of, uh, of, of collaborating the, with, the, with the community. And, uh, and after thinking what kind of project would I do there, uh, I chose to work on, the, on, on this place that used to be a kind of community center, a place that they used uh, for a while as a, as a social service dentist, and which was abandoned and used uh, by some of the locals as a place where they would uh, shoot or inject uh, heroin. The place had been, uh, had been cleared. And, uh, and it was in that place that, uh, that we decided, or I decided with, uh, with the people that were assisting me, uh, to work and to transform it into the museum of El Cerro. So it was really about uh, giving continuity to the work that, uh, that Chemi had started. And uh, what I dedicated myself during the 10 days that I was uh, there was to visit the different houses and to ask the people if they had a, an object that we could show in the museum. This was actually also my first, uh, let's say, real curatorial experience. I had done other things before. I was coming from architecture. At the time, I was between working as an artist, doing architecture, studying my, my PhD. And it was really here where, where a lot of my ideas about what uh, curating is and, uh, and how to work curatorially uh, came together. A lot of the houses I visit, uh, they would say, uh, we don't have anything the, to show in the museum because of the idea they had a, of a museum as a place for high culture, a place where you show uh, sacred things or classical uh, art. Many had never been to, to a museum. So it was really entering in a dialogue with them and, uh, and trying to find what we could, uh, we could show. And slowly all the pieces started to come together. So, um, so what was interesting was really creating uh, a kind of dialogue and, uh, between the different objects that, uh, that, we, that we borrowed from the, from the community. And, uh, and in a way, find a way in which the museum could also reflect the whole, the whole kind of micro history of the place, which curiously enough was also a micro, a micro history or a microcosmos of, uh, of most of the, of the island. 
So things started, interesting things started happening. For example, uh, in one house, uh, a woman had this painting on a mirror of uh, little black angels, angelitos negros. And, uh, and she said that it was, uh, I mean, it was a significant uh, possession that she had in her house, especially because, because it was something that she had commissioned because, uh, because there were no images of, uh, of black angels and she knew that they had to exist. So, so really this, this issue of, of, of a mirror that kind of represented that community. Next to it, uh, imagine my, my last year pointing over there, uh, it was a, a, a framed poster image of uh, the Spanish arriving to the island and the Taino Indians who were the original inhabitants of the, of the community, of, of the community of the island, uh, seeing the, the Spanish arrive. And next to it uh, was a photograph of one of the inhabitants of, uh, of the community, which had left uh, or migrated to, uh, to live in New York. So with three images, you could, you could tell the whole story of, uh, of, of, of the community of El Cerro, but also, also almost the, the history of Puerto Rico. So really this idea about, about the exhibition uh, being a place where, where different works uh, come into dialogue and tell a story. Another room was, uh, let's say, a much more contemporary room. And uh, there we had some found shares that somebody had dropped. People that didn't have things to loan, we asked them for plants instead. And in it, we had the masterpiece of, uh, of the Museum of El Cerro, uh, Joconda, that, um, that uh, the big lady or the, the big boss of the, of the town lent us. She sent two of her, of her assistants to carry the the Joconda around the village to bring it to the museum. Actually, now, now in my memory, it uh, glorified, it feels almost like, uh, like Francis Alice taking the copies of MoMA to the PS1 or, uh, or Javier Telles uh, having the lion going around uh, the favela in, uh, in Caracas. Um, so, so she was very proud because, because she had a, a piece of art that she could lend, uh, lend to the mu museum, which of, co of course, uh, her having it was a pro uh, a result of the of the economy of, of subsistence of uh, of drug selling of the of the community. We also wanted to have a a neon that uh, that said museum museo outside of uh, outside of the of the museum, so people could see it when they entered the plaza where you saw the basketball court. Uh, when they were installing it, it broke, so at the end we just had it in. Um, on the floor, but this idea also that uh, I mean that that you only need to name the things to make it happen. No? So by having a sign that said museum, you you transformed it into into a museum, and then people uh, people from the village uh, visiting the the museum. A lot of the objects had to do with their personal lives, the, the uh, religious movements, uh, transitions in life, transitions into adulthood, uh, trophies of sports. They were really good in sports, so really also finding. Uh, Finding moments that um, in, in which they could like feel like uh, proud of themselves. Uh, others had to do, for example, uh, with their involvement in the U.S. Army or in the in the different uh, in the different wars in the region. So really, this idea of uh, of using the museum to tell this uh, micro history. Many years later, ten years later, I found that uh, the group material, the, the collective of artists in New York, to which uh, Julie Out and uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, amongst others, had done in New York in the 80s, I think, or 70s, uh, a project called "The People's Choice: Arroz con Mango," which means almost a, a mix of uh, everything, in which they had asked the, the people from their local neighborhood for objects that could uh, could represent them. No? So they sent a flyer around inviting the people. They had their uh, so uh, it was a, a kind of interesting coincidence that, uh, that, that made, me, made me think, okay, maybe I was going in the right direction. Interestingly enough, also the aesthetic was very similar. No, of course, they did a much more salon-like salon, uh, salon -like, uh, exhibition, but also the kind of uh, momentums and, uh, and, uh, and pieces of, of their life that, uh, that they shared in that exhibition were very similar to the ones that... Uh, that the, the people in Puerto Rico to the, to the one of the exiles in New York uh, 20 years uh, before. Um, but beyond that, what I think is really important is that, uh, that Chemi Rosado, the artist, um, has, been con has, has continued to be involved uh, with the community. 
uh, more in the recent years where, where he has really retaken the project, has been uh, painting the, the houses again, has been uh, continuing find, finding ways in which to activate the community and use painting as, a, as an excuse to change uh, a place. And that's Chemi standing uh, a few months ago seeing uh, the village of, uh, of El Cerro. I will use the, the San Juan as a case study just to, um, to explain also some other, other projects or ideas uh, that I've done. Uh, San Juan has two museums, uh, the Museum of uh, Arte Contemporáneo, I think, of uh, Puerto Rico, and the Museum de Arte de Puerto Rico. Here's the Museum de Arte Contemporáneo, which uh, is more used as a parking lot than as a place that uh, people visit. And many of the exhibitions are something like this. For example, David La Chapelle. Not that I have anything against David, if he's a friend of yours. But yes, the question of why is a museum in Puerto Rico paying transport uh, and shipment of an exhibition that maybe doesn't make so much sense amongst, uh, amongst their public, instead of producing an exhibition that could resonate or, the, or, could, or could work with, uh, with their local artists and resonate with their, with their local, local community. And, uh, and a similar case uh, in the Museum of Arte de Puerto Rico. Again, nothing against the museum. Um, uh, a kind of air-conditioned fortress, which actually does a very good, uh, a very good job in, in, in having a, a kind of small but, uh, but significant uh, collection of uh, historical local art from modern art to, to contemporary. There's at least, uh, in most of the cases, one, one work of art uh, representing each of the artists. So it's, so it's, it's actually a, a very good historical uh, resource in, or, in order to... Um, to access the history of Puerto Rican art. Of course, uh, and, and this is very important, not in dialogue with, uh, with the rest of the Caribbean, so also the loss of opportunity of, of many of, of these centers in, uh, in not having uh, or not being in, in, in dialogue. Funnily, we, we, we don't have anyone from, uh, from these museums representing uh, here in, uh, in the Tilting Axis conferences. No? Uh, works, for example, like uh, a great work by, uh, by Celia Rodriguez, the, the Cuban-Puerto Rican uh, modernist who, 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 did, who does this uh, geometric uh, erotic uh, forms, or documentation of the, of the history of uh, print make, making and uh, poster making in, uh, in Puerto Rico, which was very significant, especially in the 60s and 70s. Less fortunate, uh, more, uh, more contemporary activations. This is uh, a prize that they have every two years, the Lexus Prize. Again, uh, money which could be better invested. And a lot, uh, a lot of the situation that, uh, that I find in, in many places is similar. No? There's, uh, the museums are there, they, they keep the art for the future, but, uh, but in a way they don't connect to their, to their communities and they don't have uh, enough funds to do, uh, to do ex exhibitions, to, do, uh, to, do, to, do, to have curators, and, and a lot of the budget uh, goes into paying the, the AC, the, the air conditioning. So um, this is a drawing done by Tony Cruz, an, uh, an artist of Puerto Rico. And uh, a few years ago, there was a law uh, that uh, went through in, uh, in Puerto Rico in which people from the, from the poor housing estates um, had to pay a minimum quota of electricity in order not to, uh, not to continue stealing the electricity from, from the grid. So what he suggested is that, uh, that the Museum of Art of Puerto Rico should connect to these uh, housing states in order for it to pay their conditioning, and then, uh, and then the museum would have uh, money to, uh, to do programming and build, uh, build a collection. Puerto Rico also has a triennial that happens every three years, uh, some years uh, or some occasions with more success, others with, uh, with less. For example, this was six years ago, uh, one curated by Adriano Pedrosa, co-curated by with uh, Jens Hoffman and Julieta Gonzalez and Beatriz. And one of the great things that came out of it is that they uh, they invited artists to do uh, artist publications or artist books. So at least uh, 20 or 25 uh, new books of uh, of artists, which were not catalogs, they were really thought as, as artist books, circulated and were produced, which is something that something some, sometimes is lacking in in our context. Others uh, less fortunate, like uh, this year's uh, curated by, by Gerardo Mosquera, which, uh, which was very well-intentioned, 
But again, even Avinal that has a, a big budget, I don't remember how much is the budget, maybe someone from, uh, from Puerto Rico knows better, but uh, let's say uh, 1.3 million. Uh, a lot, or, or at least half of the budget goes to, uh, to paying transport and shipping. And to make things worse, uh, a lot of the works didn't arrive or were held by costumes. So you had empty or semi-empty spaces. On the other hand, it was, it was really good in activating uh, other spaces around uh, around San Juan and making, making things happen uh, parallel to the Biennale. And then, well, things of what uh, normal people sometimes think is culture and, uh, uh, and against those that we have to fight, you know, this, the, the exhibition of the, of the Chinese bodies traveling around in uh, Puerto Rico, or a concert by Gianni, or the, or the idea of, uh, of the shopping mall, you know, in the case of Puerto Rico, the, the Plaza das Americas. So it was, it was um, it was uh, against this context or, or in this context that, uh, that I was invited by a local artist, uh, Radames Juni Figueroa, to participate in a, an exhibition project that he was doing in his own apartment. So a lot of, um, a lot of different artists in, uh, in Puerto Rico have, uh, have uh, taken uh, or, 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 or reacted towards their context by, uh, by creating uh, micro exhibition spaces or artist run spaces, uh, different spaces where, uh, where they activate their local artistic community. And Radames was one of them. And he invited me to do the last exhibition uh, of, a, of a yearly series that he had done that he called La Loseta, which means the ceramic tile on the floor, the ceramic tiles that were in his apartment. And I told him, why not, instead of doing it in your, in your apartment, uh, we do it in La Comay, which is a beautiful beach, uh, maybe 30 minutes away from San Juan, where he would always um, take me. And, uh, and I always had this idea of, of wanting to do an exhibition in kind of the open air, or the kind of the idea of the, of the green, green open cube instead of the white cube. Of course, the, the Biennale was a reaction to the, to the idea of the, of the Trinale, but also to this idea of a, of a Caribbean Biennale that maybe many of you uh, remember a kind of fiction art event created by uh, Mauricio Catalan for, uh, do, do people say startist? Like, like they say starchitects, startist. Which, uh, which, which, I mean, they called it the six, I think the six Caribbean Biennial. Or the six Caribbean Biennial. And basically it was a, an opportunity for artists to go on vacation to an island. And, um, but which, which was also very damaging to the, to the image of, uh, of a real Caribbean biennial that used to happen uh, at that time, you know, because people got confused, thought that this was a real biennial. Uh, uh, as a punishment, they had bad weather, so, so they couldn't enjoy the Caribbean, so, so that was the only good thing that, uh, that came out of it. But they did this kind of luxury catalog. Uh, Jens Hoffman was used as a, as a rabbit by Mauricio Catalan as a, as a curator. I think Jens, until today, repents his participation. And, uh, on that Biennale and still asks forgiveness for, for it. So, so in a way we were reacting to, to that. So this is uh, Radames, uh, Radames Juni Figueroa who, was, uh, who had invited me and I was my co-curator of the first and only uh, Tropical Biennial. And, uh, and next to him, uh, Jose Lerma. So the idea that the Biennale could fit all in a car. No? So everybody uh, was invited to participate. It was an open call. We only asked people to send us um, to send us proposals, and uh, and then we would be in dialogue with them, just just in uh, a bit of ping pong on ideas, just polishing uh, some of the ideas. But but basically, it was an open uh, an open call scenario. It happened next to uh, to this kiosk, a uh, food kiosk called La Comay, which is uh, run by uh, descendants of uh, Afro Puerto Ricans and who who do some of the most amazing uh, food on the on the island. And, uh, and the work of different artists was, uh, was inserted in different places in, uh, in, in, in the beach or in the jungle uh, behind it. Uh, this is Carolina Caicedo, a flag saying live local lo love, which has to do with ideas of self-determination, which make a lot of, a lot of sense in, uh, in the island of Puerto Rico. Um, this work was a kind of anonymous work done by, by, done by Radames, which brought some of the tiles or graffitied some of the, the, the patterns of the tiles in his apartment and brought, it, brought them to the, to the beach. So a kind of, a, a kind of Carl Andre of his apartment. Uh, other works were uh, ready-made, so we asked uh, artists for permissions to, uh, 
to reproduce uh, their work. So these are sculptures by Erika Versuti, or, or sculptures by instruction by Erika Versuti, in which uh, fruits and uh, vegetables are supported by, by three pencils. This is uh, Jesus Bubu Negron, and, uh, and what he did was a project that he had been wanting to do for a long time, um, reproducing the kind of masks, the traditional masks that the people of, uh, ar around uh, Loisa, which is the town where, where this beach and La Comay are located, uh, do for, uh, for traditional festivals. Um, Bubu is an, ar an artist that's very in, in interested in reactivating uh, ideas of handcrafts and folkloric art. And, uh, and he went with one of the masters of Loisa to try to learn the, um, to try to learn the official, the, the kind of the, ma the to master the, the idea of, uh, of coconut carving and doing masks of, out of coconut. Uh, the, the, um, the artesano, the handcrafter, uh, said no, that he wouldn't teach him. But fortunately, and because uh, Bubu is very persistent, uh, he found videos on YouTube of, uh, <laughs> of the carver doing masks. So, so he learned the technique. <coughs> and what Bubu did was uh, a dream he had had for a long time, which was putting the coconut masks back on the coconuts or use them, uh, using them as masks for, uh, for coconuts. Uh, Radames himself, he made a, a rainbow out of uh, electricity pipes. Uh, Guillermo E. Rodriguez transformed a, a Bertola chair into a hamburger grilling uh, thing. And really this kind of horrible packaged uh, hamburgers. If, you know, if you've been to Puerto Rico, you know that most of the island uh, I mean, produces very little of their own food and it has to import junk from the United States. Uh, Alana Iturralde did this kind of elastic participative structures in which uh, were activated only when a, when a group of people uh, handled them. Joel Rodriguez, another young artist, uh, uh, connected two uh, microphones to two palm trees and then connected them to two, an amplifier so you could amplify the sound of the wind passing through the, through the palm trees. And then, the, as, as, a, as, as a proper biennial, there was an award ceremony in George. Uh, there was a golden pineapple, and, uh, and the jury decided that, uh, that Jesus Bubu Negron and his coconut masks uh, were, were the winners of the, of the first uh, biennale. Another award went to the people of the Comay for, uh, for keeping alive the, and, uh, the, the, their food traditions, the, the mixed food traditions of, uh, of African and uh, Puerto Rican uh, heritage. So here's some delicious wedges, and uh, I forget how these round uh, plantain balls are called. Uh, Alcapurrias. So, well, that was uh, the Bienal Tropical. So, so many of these questions uh, have taken me to, to ask uh, what kind of uh, museum uh, do we want? So I'm gonna share with you some, some ideas that uh, I've been collecting over the, over the past years that, uh, that some might resonate uh, with you. Some resonate with the projects I do and in a way kind of inspire them. Um, these are uh, protests at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, Black and Puerto Rican art must be represented, in which, of course, uh, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, founder of the Museo del Barrio, was, uh, was part of and uh, inspired him to, to open the, the Museo del Barrio in New York as a place of, of representation of the Puerto Rican community in New York, and some, uh, some ideas of uh, Montañez Ortiz around the museum. For example, the idea that uh, the museum is, uh, is first about the content and not about, uh, not about the structure. Or oh, him talking about, um, about how this cultural disenfranchisement had led him to search a way to authenticize his ethnic experience and founding the Museo del Barrio, a practical alternative to the orthodox museum which he hoped would facilitate the revival of living values and thereby personalized cultural experience. Or other ideas uh, which he had about the museum, the idea that uh, the museum should, co should be conceived and that all its exhibitions should start with the idea of, uh, of the rainforest. So this idea that, uh, that what one should enter this kind of tropical, uh, or at least conceptual tropical, uh, tropical rainforest in a way in which people could relate to the, to the idea of the museum. So really kind of, of, of the museum as a kind of, again, this idea of the green cube against the idea of the, of the kind of white pristine space. I mean, this is maybe, uh, I, I've tried to ask uh, Rafael himself and, um, 
and, and Rocio, the curator of our Museo del Barrio, for any photographs of, uh, of that conceptual rainforest. Rafael says they are, but we haven't been able to, uh, to track them. So at least an image of, uh, this is a, a Museum of Natural History in the Amazon, in Iquitos, in Peru, nothing to do, but at least an image of, of maybe how, this, uh, how this, uh, this, this interior of the museum, uh, museum could look. Uh, more ideas uh, regarding the museum. In this case, Clementine de Lis, who was working in Frankfurt in the ethnographic uh, museum, and ideas about how to keep, um, how to keep ethnographical uh, material alive, uh, and the idea that the museum shouldn't be uh, preserved jars, but really uh, a workstation and not a, not a curiosity cabinet. Other ideas, this one comes from Brent Kolkhas, I don't know how, how how, um, how much I um, agree with some of his ideas, but, but with this one, it does make sense. It's the idea of a museum of 800 rooms, and he says, take eight artists, scientists, individuals, a year, give them a room each, and after 100 years, you have the museum of the century. So again, th this idea about how to build a, a collection, that, that if you do it slowly and you find ways of, uh, you can slowly build that, uh, that, that museum. This is uh, Mario Pedrosa, in uh, a Brazilian uh, thinker, uh, historian, critic. And uh, in a letter that he writes to Oscar Niemeyer when they're building uh, Brasilia, and they're thinking about how that museum of Brasilia should be, a museum that actually uh, never, never existed as such, but at least this, uh, until very recently. But at least this idea, and he says, um, well, you can read it better than me there, but. Uh, but he says that, uh, that, we should, that they shouldn't build a museum like every museum in, uh, that was happening in Sao Paulo, that they had lots of failures, that, uh, that the museum would never be complete, that it would always be made out of parts. Still at this time, we're talking 59, but thinking this idea of a museum, um, that a museum should represent the, the, the art history of the world. You know? And uh, the interesting part of his thought is really that he says, uh, the museum to be built in Brasilia should have a sui generis in character. In order to attend above all objectives of educational and documentation order, it can be then a museum in the traditional mold, characterized by a collection of original works. Because of the conditions exposed, a, collec a collection of that order, worthy of the name of a museum, is an extremely difficult thing. The museum of Brasilia will not attempt to acquire original artworks for its collection. It will be a museum of copies photographic reproductions, moldings of every kind, maquettes. Its originality will consist mainly in not pretending to compete with original collections of its counterparts of the country or the world. So really this uh, uh, totally avant-garde idea of the time of, of making a museum of, uh, of copies, uh, which of course, I mean, the only, the only limitation that he had is that he was still reading uh, art history at the time as a kind of linear construct of uh, European, Western, uh, history from the Greek to the, to the Renaissance, to, uh, to Western, to the United States. So, so maybe that was the only failure of the museum, but, but the, 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 the originality of the, of the idea of the copy, copies, which I think is still, still relevant today. And this is an exhibition that, uh, that happened last year in Rio de Janeiro uh, by Mexican artist uh, Damian Ortega. Damian was not aware of, uh, of Mario Pedrosa's text, but still interesting how he reacts to a, a condition of a, of a very limited uh, budget, uh, the, the impossibility of paying for, uh, for transportation, for shipping, and, uh, and working with, uh, with local knowledge, and in this case with, uh, with the sculptures of the, of the, car of the carnival carts, uh, which make this kind of amazing carts and fantasies uh, every year uh, for carnival. And I, I thought it was interesting to show this uh, also because people yesterday were talking about the, the, the carnival exhibition that's gonna travel through some of the islands of the Caribbean. So, um, so Damian worked with the, with the carnival artisans in order to produce copies of, uh, of major works of uh, modern and contemporary art. There you can see the back, uh, the carving of, the, the, of the Gabriel Orozco, his master's uh, Citroen but also putting in kind of uh, in dialogue or collapsing historic times in this, uh, in this case, uh, there was an Olmec head, but also this lying Buddha. Or uh, here you see the, the Joseph Boy's uh, combi with the slides. On the back you see the Citroen. And the, the, the exhibition was always changing or works being added as conformly time evolved. 
as the workers were, uh, were producing new, new sculptures. This was the final uh, installation. And um, I mean, the great thing here, you see the Jeff Koons, and you see the Giacometti, and you see the, the, uh, the Gabriel Orozco Citroen, and that kind of uh, totemic, uh, I don't know if it's... Uh, but, uh, but the interesting thing, in the back you see what used to be the Joseph Boys uh, combi, now transformed into the Paolo Nazaret uh, combi with bananas uh, work that some of you might know. The, uh, again, continuing to think of ideas of museums, this is Harold Seaman in a conferences that they had in the 70s. And just uh, something, uh, an interesting thought that where he says uh, the ideal museum would be the one that was closed by the authorities. So that's the kind of uh, the kind of museum that we would we would like. And again, thinking of the of the museum as an information center, and as a, as a transmitting center instead of being as usual a repository of consecrated material. Uh, this is a drawing by uh, Pedro Reyes, a Mexican artist, and he's, he says how to use a museum. Two options. One is that it could be a fridge to preserve things for posterity in perfect uh, conditions, or two, as an oven to cook new realities. So more ovens, less uh, fridges. Uh, Jonah Friedman, the, the Hungarian artist based in France. Uh, again, it is the exhibits that make a museum. So, so the idea of a museum that could happen in the street using the language of, uh, of street sellers. Or Luis Camitzer, the Uruguayan artist based in New York, with, uh, with this phrase that he's installed in different facades of museums, which, say, which says the museum is a school, the artist learns to communicate, the public learns to make connections. So really signaling uh, the responsibilities of each of the participants of, uh, that make uh, or that construct the, the museum. Uh, there you see it at um, the Museo de Arte de Ponce uh, below. I don't remember where it was. This was recently at the exhibition I curated in uh, in Mexico City at uh, at Museo Humex. In, so in every place it has a language of uh, of the place. So from here we're gonna jump to the idea of rethinking tropical histories. I'm gonna just go quickly over it, but I thought it was interesting as a way to connect with the Caribbean, uh, this project that I've been working or that I worked, uh, started to work in 2010. So really the, the idea of creating a kind of diagram or a network in which, uh, in which different uh, art histories from the tropics could, uh, could connect and could be told. Um, Many of these histories existed, but they existed by nations, and there was no kind of regional connections. So in a way, also responding to Alfred Barr's uh, typical uh, diagram of cubism and abstract art that he made for the, for the MoMA, but also to, to other uh, trees of art. This one made by Miguel Covarrubias, a Mexican cartoonist and artist and anthropologist, where he has this kind of art, uh, history of art, even though he was Mexican, no one from uh, outside Western European and North American tradition is present in this, uh, in this tree. Uh, years later, Ad Reinhardt, inspired by that tree, uh, does how to look at modern art in America. Here, at least some other uh, art histories start to appear. You can see the, the branch falling down by the weight of uh, Mexican muralism. And also in the top, he has some uh, leaves, and the leaves, uh, he says something like, um, like there's some, if, if we miss your name or if you're not in the tree, there's some extra leaps. Feel free to incorporate your, yourself to, to art history. More recently, uh, Gerhard Richter, uh, who some think he's the greatest artist alive, this kind of um, diagram or uh, uh, survey of, uh, of what he believes is art history in different fields, art, uh, poetry, music, literature, Funnily enough, uh, most of them European and North America, almost no woman except Isa Gensken, his ex-wife, and uh, maybe a, a few other. And uh, so, so really, again, this idea that, that we need to produce our own diagrams and histories to contest uh, those, those histories that, uh, that we have inherited here. This one got into the way. Uh, Tate's own kind of uh, diagram of uh, art movements and history, which tries to have a much more global outlook and incorporate uh, those artists of what once was a periphery. So really my proposal is, uh, I mean, my proposal was to do this, um, this tropical history in a banana bunch, and uh, I'll go maybe if we have time a little bit more into, into details. But, uh, 
but maybe if we could construct that history of the of the Caribbean, if we could uh, if we could build that diagram and interconnect the the histories of art of the Caribbean and the and in a kind of almost a rhizomatic way, maybe I thought inspired by uh, by Edward Glissant's uh, table of the of the diaspora as a way of, of finding ways in which we can create diagrams which connect and and put in dialogue many of these practices, many of which have uh, been disconnected. So something similar like that was what I tried to do with, uh, with the banana tree. The idea of turning around the map that comes from uh, Joaquin Torres Garcia. The idea of emptying the slide projectors of art history of images, which comes from Luis Camitzer's uh, history lessons. And the idea that each banana was a different, um, a, di a different uh, chapter, a different moment, and, and create this kind of new relationships from the first kind of uh, artists that came to, to draw the, the colonies, in this case, uh, Albert Eckhart and the kind of uh, the paintings of the cannibals, or Alexander von Humboldt uh, here. My dear friend Gabriela Rangel always gets angry at me when I say that, uh, that the drawing, on one hand, it served uh, us to acquire knowledge of, uh, of, of, the, of the continent, but were also tools of colonization. Uh, Frederick Church uh, drawing the, the landscapes of, um, of the Americas, uh, uh, Siqueiros with his mural for America Tropical. So really starting to create this kind of different, uh, different kind of free connections, uh, even between Rousseau and his kind of idealized uh, fiction of the jungle that he never went, or Wilfredo Lamb's own uh, The Jungle upon returning from Paris. Moments like the, the, the ship in which uh, Wilfredo Lamb and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Levi Strauss were traveling uh, to the Americas, which uh, Levi Strauss mentions uh, all the other intellectuals going in the boat, but he never mentions Lamb, for example. Uh, Levi Strauss' all, own understanding of, of the tropics, uh, what I call the, the trinity of. Uh, of uh, the Trinity of uh, Brazil, uh, the tropical Trinity of Brazil, Augusto Boal and the Theater of the Press, Paulo Freire and the pedago pedagogy of the press, and Lina Bobardi with her rethinking of exhibitions and museums and popular artifacts. And all the history crossed by the presence of, uh, of the dictatorships, so, so a kind of a wound that, uh, of emptiness in that kind of tropical history, which maybe there should be another later wound, which is the wound inflicted by, by neo neoliberalism. And, uh, and two important moments, or two, or two definitive moments in the history of the tropics, uh, at least for me. One, Elio Itisica, his idea that the, that the tropics are also, or being tropical is also politics. But also what's interesting in him is the transition from really kind of a geometric European abstraction into kind of a sculptures which you can, you can pass through or walk through into incorporating the aesthetic of the, of the favelas or the aesthetic of the other or the aesthetic of, uh, of the poor in creating the, the parangoles, the capes that, uh, that you could wear, and really bringing into the museum this kind of subversive uh, structures of, of the other. So here you really see the transition from, from geometry into, into wearable uh, sculptures. Or someone else like, uh, like Dominique Gonzalez Foster more recently, who also has like, advanced our own understanding of tropicality or, or with the idea of, uh, of tropical modernity. You know? so, so this something else which uh, happened to European modernity when transplanted to the, to the Americas, which allowed uh, for something else to happen which was not existing in, the, in, in, in Europe, but also the fragility of this, of this kind of, uh, of this tropical moment, so the kind of uh, the easiness in which they can be, uh, they can disappear, you know? The idea of trop tropicalization, so really kind of, uh, of tropicalizing uh, moments, spaces, uh, architecture. In the case, for example, of her intervention at the Sao Paulo Biennale, where the columns of the Marquis in Ibepra started to multiply, like if they were trees or vegetation. Or more recently, in an exhibition uh, of hers that I curated at the MAM in Rio de Janeiro, where, uh, again, with very little budget, uh, she covered uh, the windows of the museum on one side red and in the other side uh, blue, and really kind of transforming the museum into this kind of uh, lenses, three-dimensional lenses, in which the space uh, and, the, and the works itself, very early works of her career, would be activated through this kind of three-dimensionality, 
but also activating the, the landscape uh, itself and, and, and seeing the landscape in a, in a different uh, way. So this idea, uh, more research has to be done, uh, more, more connections need to be, need to be made. Uh, sometimes I, I continue uh, working on the diagram itself, adding other artists, creating new connections, uh, but now there's not enough space. So, uh, but what, what was really interesting is that it kind of works as a kind of exhibition, as a, as a poster that people can take away, that, uh, that appears in different places, uh, that it's changed uh, in, in different exhibitions that it's appeared. So there's been a green version, a yellow version, a, a pink version. And this takes us to the idea of, of how the museum that contains this collection should be if there should be a museum or if it should have any kind of structure or if we should take over a structure, in this case inspired by Martin Kippenberger's uh, MOMAS, a museum that, uh, that happened in an abattoir in the island of Syros in Greece, and which only existed because again he had the sign that said this is MOMAS. This is uh, with my friend Maria Papadimitro revisiting uh, MOMAS. She's waiting for me in the ferry station. And now the... the the abattoir transformed into a, a kind of water treatment uh, place. Or maybe we could be inspired by uh, Marcel Bodauers and his idea of the, of the Museum of, uh, of the Eagles, in which he kind of uh, rethinks the, the history, in this case of, uh, of Belgian colonialism, using also a kind of uh, greenhouse garden uh, display. Or maybe this museum uh, could have uh, hammocks instead of, uh, of, of, of an exhibition as a place of thinking, inspired by, uh, by Lucio Costa's installation for the Trinello of, of, uh, of Milan in the, in the 50s, or a kind of recent uh, re readequation of it by the uh, Burio de Intervenciones Públicas from Guatemala done in, uh, in Costa Rica at the Museum of Art in, in Costa Rica. So really the, this idea of uh, of rethinking the kind of uh, spaces and museums in which in which we are, and uh, and uh, and and what uh, what kind of architecture could influence uh, this kind of open air museum? Uh, if the museum should have a collection, or if the if if the work should only be activated by instructions uh, before the the pavilion Cuba in uh, in Havana, which is a kind of open air structure where where things happen below, or here Hilitla by Edward James, where he tried to copy the the kind of the, the tropical vegetation and make it last forever in structures of concrete. concrete. That's him in the, in the natural landscape. So, so I just ideas about how this museum should be, how the architecture should be, if it should have a collection or not, and, uh, and, and what could inspire. Uh, so, so all these ideas took me to do this exhibition of, uh, of, the, of the Museo Tropical in uh, Teoretica in Costa Rica. It's important to mention Teoretica, and I've also been mentioning some cases in, in Central America, because I think uh, Virginia Perez Raton, she was always uh, very insistent of the relationship between uh, Central America and the Caribbean, and it was something that she, that she always constantly uh, pushed for. And... Um, and now that she's uh, she's not there, uh, I think that it's something that uh, that is important to to bring back. So basically, uh, Inti, who was there, the curator at the time, asked me to uh, activate the, the banana diagram. So again, uh, I commissioned Federico Herrero to do the sign of the museum. Again, this idea that the naming the museum activates the museum, and how to do an exhibition the cheapest way possibly. So basically, what you need is just uh, tables and, and trestles and a lot of JPGs that you can you can print out. So digital uh, material that you can print out. And, uh, and what, again, what's more important is the idea of the, of the content, no? the idea that you can have uh, fakes or you can have copies that you don't need to, to have the originals. Of course, always working in collaboration with the artists to make, uh, to make this happen. But for example, drawings by Fernando Brais about the intervention of, uh, of the United States in Guatemala in the 50s because of the, because of the United Fruit Company and the coup d'etat that they did against the democratically elected uh, president. Uh, Jacobo Arbenz, no? the influence that this had in El, in El Che, or uh, an archive of uh, intervention of uh, American uh, banana companies in Colombia by uh, Jose Alejandro Rastrepo, or in another table, building a history of artists that work with, uh, with the idea of the bananas. 
So from Gabriel Orozco, the sleeping bag with banana leaves, to Naufus Figueroa, sleeping with bananas, to, uh, to Kiriko, a little bit higher upstairs with uh, the train of time and the bananas. Works by uh, Milton Machado about uh, constructing a hotel in the shape of a banana in the, in the Bay of Rio de Janeiro. Andy Warhol with uh, another hero, Mario Montes, eating the banana. Or younger artists like uh, Javier, Javier Bosques from uh, Puerto Rico and this video where he's fighting the banana, the banana flower. So really this idea that you, you can build a micro museum almost with nothing, with a, with a kind of limited budget. What's more important is, uh, is the content. Uh, here a work by, uh, by Carlo Ibarra, Carlo, in which he tattoos uh, bananas with, uh, with uh, news, um, news fragments of the conflictive relationship between the countries of Central America and the Caribbean rela relating to the, to the United States. And then in the side room, we had uh, on one of the tables the diagram that explains the whole history of the bananas and a kind of cinema where, um, where different videos relating to the bananas were projected. So really this idea of how to do a, a micro museum with a limited budget, but which uh, makes sense locally and which also could have, uh, could have other resonances. Uh, and here uh, a fountain done by Radames Juni Figueroa, again a, an instruction work uh, a fountain, a never-ending fountain of happiness where everybody uh, just drinks from the, from the fountain. I think we run out of time. Uh, if you want five minutes more, I'll show you something else, and if not, we finish here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, just to finish, so I wanted to show you some other ideas of, of artists uh, rethinking again the, the idea of the museum, no? and, uh, which I find uh, very inspiring. Uh, and uh, So one is uh, Jonathan Andrade, an artist from uh, Recife in, uh, in Brazil, which he has been working the idea of the museum of the, of the Northeast. And, and again, this idea of, uh, of connecting uh, or creating connect connections beyond Brazil, beyond uh, the Caribbean. Um, again, because very similar uh, colonial histories, uh, histories of uh, slavery, history of uh, race that, 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 that create resonances. Um, and uh, the Museo del Omen del Nordeste, the Museum of the Man of Nordeste, was created by, um, originally in the 70s by Gilberto Freire, a Brazilian anthropologist as a response to, to his idea that the Brazilian man was created by the mix of the, of the African slaves, the European colonizers, and the native Indians, and a kind of ethnographical museum that could represent uh, the man of, uh, of today in the northeast of Brazil, one of the poorest areas of, uh, of Brazil. Like many other museums, it's one of these dusty museums, and, um, and Jonatas thought about how to, uh, how to activate it uh, or reactivate it, so he made this, uh, non-official uh, project in which he, um, he photographs men of the Northeast, uh, men of the city of Recife where he lives, asks, asks them permission to be the, the official face of these posters of the, of the man of the Northeast. And then it becomes this kind of installation or this kind of uh, posters for the, for the museum. With the idea again that uh, I mean that people can move the posters around, so it's a, a museum that's activated by the people, but it's also activated by by desire, no? by the desire of uh, of the other uh, of wanting to to be part of this museum, which of course uh, makes sense in terms of uh, of Jonathan's finding also who who is he or who is he as a mixed man in Brazil and what are the implications, but also the the, impli the, the difference on why he being similar to these men has had the privilege to, to, to go to school, go to school, go to university, become a, an artist and, uh, and watch what has prevented others not to. And the museum has been presented in different, uh, in different locations, in this case in, um, in Lisbon, for example, but also in, uh, in Senegal, I think this was at the Binal there, in a much more simple version in which the, it was only the hanging posters without a wooden structure, but again, that, uh, that people could move around and kind of rethink uh, and relate to that idea of the, of the museum. Another museum that's very close to my heart, this is in Guatemala, the NUMU, the No Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Guatemala. So a response by an artist there, Stefan Benchum, in, um, 
and Jessica Kyrie to um, to the lack of a contemporary art museum in uh, in, in in their location, and and thinking what they could do or how they could activate a museum. Uh, finally, they used the the excuse of a Biennale happening there to use the money of their participation to rent. Uh, an egg, a concrete egg that used to be an egg selling point and transform it into uh, Guatemala's first museum of uh, contemporary art. This was the first exhibition where they invited artist Federico Herrero to, uh, to intervene with painting the, the museum. This was maybe two and a half years ago and since then they've done at least 10 exhibitions in, in, the, in the micro egg and really kind of activating their, their local context. Um, more recently, and maybe you saw, this should be 2015, uh, by uh, maybe Pablo showed it early in the, uh, in the morning, uh, Michael Linares, uh, the Museo del Palo. So again, kind of a, an anthropological uh, museum, kind of tracing the history of, of the stick as, a, as man's um, like first kind of uh, element uh, or first cultural uh, object and the kind of different uh, uses and collections of, uh, of sticks. Of course, uh, palo also has different uh, meanings in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, palo is also uh, uh, a drink, vamos a darnos un palo, but also palo, is, they can uh, hit you, or it can also uh, relate to, to sex. But also, I mean, I'm very interested in this idea of how to, how to, how, how to construct a museum, no? and I think Michael uh, really succeeded in a, in finding kind of a, a simple way in which, again, it's more important uh, the, the, the content than, um, and how to do it in a kind of with what you have at hand. You know? So really kind of a plywood folded to, to become screens, which in a way, it, it's something that always relates me to the, to the idea of the first uh, museums, you know, like, like this kind of archeological or ethnographic museums, uh, really kind of people making, making simple museums before before this idea of the museum became such so elaborate. And so there's, uh, there's Michael uh, over there. And finally, uh, a series of uh, interventions by, by Angel Leonardo, in this case with uh, Laura Castro in the uh, Dominican Republic. Again, um, working in this, in this case in the context of a brutalist uh, museum the Museum of Art of, uh, of, the, of Dominicana, in the context again of the, of the Biennal, a kind of very democratic and populist Biennal where everything uh, fits in a place where also uh, the art around it is kind of rotting. And Angela and Laura tropicalizing the museum through their research on the tropical architecture of the island. So, so small interventions happening around the museum in which they bring the architecture elements traditional to, to the tropics and to the island in order to kind of tropicalize a brutalist uh, museum. No? So, so in a way, finding ways into which bring alive uh, a museum that if not dead is in, in coma. And in this way through, um, through this kind of minor uh, interventions. This, um, this research of um, of architectonic language in the island is something that, uh, that continues to be of interest to Angel. And in a project that he did a year later at the Museum of the Dominican Man, which is again uh, next door. And it's interesting, for example, that, uh, that Jonatas, I mean, he works with the Museum of the Man of the Northeast, uh, Angel with the Museum of the Dominican Man. This idea also that these museums were, were constructed with this kind of uh, machista idea of, uh, of the man. You know? And I think, in a way, both uh, both do a critique of uh, of this kind of um, mas over masculinity of, uh, of of the idea of the of the museums. No, uh, Jonathan's homo eroticizing it, and, uh, and this is Angel. So, so again, you see outside the museum all the the, the Christian missionary, the the native Indian, the, the African slave. Again, the the same the same mix that constitutes the the kind of the American. And again, another uh, dormant museum, but still like beautiful in its uh, in its museography. You know, really the, the way the, the 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 objects are displayed in a kind of simple but uh, but elegant uh, elegant way. So Angel uh, occupied the the main space to do his 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 own version of what the 
the Museum of the, of the Dominican could be today. And again, if before he was inspired by the elements of the tropical architecture, now he kind of readapted or rethought the, the elements or different elements of, uh, of, of the vernacular of folkloric in, uh, in the Dominican after uh, research trips through the, through the island. So, um, so the idea of the, of the ceramic dolls, which is something typical in the island, transforming them into kind of abstract, uh, abstract ceramic, uh, ceramic dolls, working with the idea also of the typical traditional dresses, the, the windows, the idea also of working with the, with the chair weavers in order to construct uh, elements. So this idea of, uh, of rethinking tradition in order uh, to activate uh, dormant uh, museums. So I think there is where I leave it, and just, uh, I mean, I guess this is what I wanted to, to share with you, all these kind of uh, many, many different ideas, many which will uh, resonate uh, with some of you. I mean, I, I'm always happy also to hear of, uh, of more cases and more, more ideas uh, to create more, more connections. So, uh, so I guess this is it. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Fifty-four minutes and fifty-five seconds. Okay. Hello. Any uh, uh, question, comment? Uh, we have some mics, so if you would just raise your hand, and we can. Um, many thanks, Pablo, for your inspiration and uh, speech. Um, you mentioned that museums need to reflect the local uh, communities. That you don't need a big budget. That budget that they need to be more ovens than fridges. But um, I I see the part that you say that. They need to relate to local culture. But then my question is around scalability. I mean, how do you make these small museums gain more international audience? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that that's key for that, those type of museums, or that's not important? No, no, I, 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 think, it's, uh, I think it's very important. But, but I think what's important to see from these cases is, uh, is in which way uh, artists or curators have uh, have reacted to the situation in their own context, when, or in many cases, uh, the museums have become uh, closed, uh, closed spaces, or have closed door policies where, uh, where the local artists are not, uh, not, not part of, uh, not, not part of them. So, in doing so, they, they question the, the original structures again. Uh, I mean, this is not the case everywhere. In the past two days, uh, we've heard of other uh, museums in the region which are really rethinking uh, from the institution uh, what the institution should be. But, uh, but I'm, I'm always interesting, interesting, interested from this kind of, uh, let's say, side examples, because I think uh, in a way, uh, I mean, what artists gives, give us is this kind of questioning from, uh, from the very core of the, of the problem, no? and, and bring us new ideas into how to rethink. I mean, Again, it's not that I'm saying that uh, yeah, museums shouldn't have any budget. I mean, ideally, we should find a way in which to do things, uh, but but also also rethink uh, how we do them, no? and, and which are the priorities, and for whom are we working, and uh, and who is our public. And <coughs> um, I noticed when you were talking about various art histories. So you started with um, a painting by a European artist that had come to the Americas. And um, since we're talking about rethinking, what about rethinking before that? Like, wh why would that be the first artist? So, you know, Taino art, all these kinds of things um, for our context in Jamaica. And um, I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about that, if you had done any rethinking in that way, because that has the potential to kind of explode um, a lot of how we think about art and certainly about the museum. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think totally, and my, my, my own thinkings of, uh, of the own diagram uh, continue to evolve and rethink to the moment that, uh, that that's why I've left it a little bit to the side in, in, in order to kind of uh, to, to totally re reactivate it. Um, I mean, yes, uh, Yes, I think it's an important attempt to, to decolonize uh, the art histories that, that, that we've been taught, but I think, uh, I think more has to be done. And that's why I thought that it would be interesting 
if, if we could make that collective effort of, of really kind of, of tracing. I mean, when, when we have a, such, a, such a body of, uh, of, of intellectual knowledge and artistic knowledge in, in, in this room, for example, uh, I mean, if, if maybe in the next tilting axis encounter we, we need to, to build this, uh, this other diagram and, and create these other connections, and, and yes, maybe, maybe go, go beyond, no? My question is about, um, is following up on that question, around thinking about uh, museums that maybe move away from um, the kind of chauvinism of the visual. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you created your diagram, but I'm wondering if there are other kinds of conception of the museum that may be non-object based, non-visual in, in their focus that you might have thought about as a possibility of activating a different type of a relationship to I mean, I mean, there, for example, I talk about the idea that uh, that maybe this Museo Tropical, uh, the collection is uh, is based on on instruction, so it's based on, uh, so it's not object based. But uh, but it would be really interesting also to think uh, other kinds. I mean, now that you now that you're talking, I think uh, an, an oral museum, now that it's transmitted orally, and that kind of recovers uh, other forms of transmitting knowledge that. Uh, that today we are forgetting, no? so so I, I, I think it's a, it's an important issue to explore, and I, I would also be happy to, I mean, to know if you if you know other examples or if someone else here knows. Uh. About it, I haven't found any examples, but I mean, I think it would be really interesting to actually move into those spaces, particularly for folks who have histories that have sort of been erased, to to reactivate yeah. them, as as that mm -hmm. type of an engagement mm -hmm. with the music. I, mean, I don't I, know of any. I think that, I mean, the, the, the idea of oral transmission is, is, is very interesting, and as well as you thought, I mean, the kind of the pre-European history. Again, how, 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 do, how do we start uh, tracing it, or, or, or I don't know if incorporating is the word, but how to, or, or building, no? building this kind of other, other history, which, uh, which doesn't have, for example, authors, no? That, that's the other thing, you know? There's not a, there's not a, a star name that you can say, oh, this is, uh, this is the Eckhart of the time, or, the, or maybe, maybe there is, no, maybe. Uh, but but, but I, I, I think, I mean, that, that's what's important about your question, because it really turns the question uh, around, no? even in ideas of, uh, of, of collectivity as a, as, as, as a way in which many of this, of this knowledge was built or transmitted. No? Um, yeah, uh, my question actually goes along these lines, and it's from the, um, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and so it's really uh, following that on that. Um, I, was, I was sort of thinking about this when you showed your um, banana project, mm -hmm. and it was very much a big man uh, history of tropical art. And so, uh, you know, the question was also raised to me, what about the people without history? And then um, I was also uh, very uh, glad that you mentioned the ethnography museums and you talk about collaborations with um, ethnography museums, actually with some that seem to be you know, quite outdated. But the collaboration seems to go one way. So it's ethnographers or ethnographic museum people inviting artists to make the collections more dynamic. And so my question, putting this together or sort of you know, my uh, prompting to think about is how could the collaboration go the other way? So it's the artist that goes, uh, you know, to the communities and to the ethnographic museums, but, you know, how can you go the opposite direction into the contemporary art museum? So mm -hmm. basically I'm going along the same lines that everybody else. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that, the, I mean, the, it's, it's more about raising these issues, no, and how to, how to do these collaborations uh, both ways. I mean, for, for me, a very interesting uh, case is, I mentioned it very superficially, but it was what uh, Clementine Delis was doing at the World Culture and Museum in, uh, in Frankfurt, which is a, an ethnographic uh, collection of which she was the director for, uh, for maybe five years uh, until very recently. And, uh, and there she was really thinking of, uh, of how to activate the collection, not, a, not as a dormant collection, but a, as, a, as a kind of toolkit or, 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 a, yeah, or a manual for instruction manual for the future. You know? I mean, what could we learn about this, these objects 
which could really make us rethink the way we produce uh, things. So inviting not only artists, but uh, industrial designers and, uh, to react to, this, uh, to these objects. And, and really doing it in a kind of laboratory where, where the, the conservators from the museum would take the objects out, which they asked, bring them out in, in the tables, allow them to be a whole day with them in, a, in this kind of rooms that were uh, made specially for the, for the kind of the, the, the research of the object by the artist or the, or the industrial designer. And, and then the, the artist or the, or the designers res responding, responding to them, so a kind of, of really interesting in, in, a, in a, way of, a way of thinking a collection, which was ethno basically ethnographic, but which could also work for, for contemporary art. You know? This kind of idea of bringing objects out of, uh, out of the collection and having rooms in which specialized uh, people could, uh, could learn from the works and, and, and this kind of, of, kind of transmission rooms. You know? So, so I, for me, it's one of the interesting models. Uh, again, I'm, I'm interested to to learn more about other other model, models that you know, other ways. Uh. I'm actually very um, interested about what you just said. Uh, you quite didn't mention contemporary art uh, during the entire presentation as a terminology, and yet it seems to me that the leading uh, world has been the art world has been um, putting the contemporary art as a terminology to be used each time we want to speak about uh, global art. Mm. So I just wanted to have your point of view on what do you think about the future of contemporary <laughs> art? Does that mean that is going to open up to much more, um, you know, um, dialogues with um, what's happening in the creation of uh, community-based uh, practices? Uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a big question. Uh, maybe Tobias is it's better. A, it's uh, a PhD. <laughs> better prepared to answer it. Uh, mm. um. <laughs> <laughs> No, but 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 it, I mean it does. What you're saying does bring the question of uh, I mean why why do we do what we do and what is uh, I mean what is the meaning of of, of these objects and uh, and and what is the use for us today and and for the community today and what's what's the use for the future in, at least in terms of exhibitions which is uh, which is what I I do I, I like to do think of uh, of the exhibition as, as as an opportunity to research topics that make sense to. Uh, to the community to whom it's it's speaking, and and to work with artists who work in in, in those ways. No, in terms of uh, in terms of collections, again, well, why why are we keeping things, and what what will happen uh, with them in, in the future? No, so no, again, not 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 art per art say, and not collecting per collecting say, and really, I mean, I, I guess that's why I always go back to that first uh, project in in Puerto Rico, that that community project. Again, who 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 are public is you know is it. Uh, is it uh, the kind of, of people that think art with capital A, or, or are there also other publics? Uh? Pablo. Oh, Pablo. <laughs> Paulo. <laughs> uh, we have been talking also about uh, ex exotification of contexts and people, mm -hmm. and you showed that your banana department, mm -hmm. so to say, yeah. of the Museum Tropical, and I would like to you to expand a little bit, how do you think these signals of exotification can be reframed or reconceptualized? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in the terms of the banana, it's really simple. It's just going to the, to the core of the problem, you know, and, and what seems to be something used to exoticize. I mean, try to go to the layers underneath. I mean, what does the banana mean? Why, what, I mean, why is the banana there? What is the banana industry? What is the exploitation that came from the banana? Who planted the bananas? Who was in charge of the banana plantations? And, and why was all, all this done? I mean, was it done for, 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 for the sake of, of US American people being able to, to eat cornflakes in the morning with their, with their bananas and, and be able to grow up uh, strong? And, 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 and what happened because, because of this, you know? So, so in, a, in, a, in a way, you go beyond the cliche and, and, and really start to find uh, a, a, lot, uh, a lot underneath. And, um, and of course, you, also, you can also, do, I mean, there's, there's humor in there, which I think is, is part of, of, of at least what many, many of us are and how we deal with, uh, 
with that realities, but 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 humor doesn't uh, avoid uh, also being critical. No, so so I think they they can go go hand by hand. No? And uh, I mean, if you think, for example, in uh, I mean Andy Warhol and Mario Man Mario Montes, the, the Puerto Rican transvestite uh, who acted also with Eloy Tisica and with uh, with Jack Smith in uh, in Flaming in Flaming Cre Creatures. I mean, he's sucking a banana, and, and actually he's becoming a, he's making the banana to, a, a tool of sexual liberation or transgender. Uh, Liberation, you know. So, so again, it goes beyond, uh, beyond the kind of. Uh Hi. Uh, I thought there was something almost kind of paradoxical about the fact that you were locating practices often about the museum within these museums or kind of temporary context. But I was wondering what you thought about this idea of maybe a sort of sanitization of these alternate forms of museums. So what happens when an artist museum or an artist archive enters into a official museum <laughs> context, like the one we're in, becomes archived and somewhat removed from that space of experimentation and it perhaps is a form of sort of foreclosure because it maybe shuts down certain possibilities um, when that project's no longer active. For example, your project of the expanded mm -hmm. banana tree or you know many of the other projects you refer to. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, that's a reality with which many of us live. I mean, I live with it working at, at the Guggenheim, you know, and, and sometimes uh, incorporating works into the collection there. And, uh, but then uh, I think we're also uh, uh, utopian idealist, or I think at least me, or I, I think also Tobias, in which, in which we think also that, that these works will be reactivated, that they will come out again. And, uh, and if they don't, I do have the hope that those that come uh, behind us will... Uh, will if not activate the originals, we'll also make copies of them, we'll kind of, uh, I mean, m make uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable situations out of, uh, and con continue rethinking how to, how, how to activate and how to. <laughs> no, but I, I, I think to, to add to that point, there is something slightly, ben almost strange about the fact that at the beginning you were talking about this utopian idea of, of, of making a copy, right, a direct copy. Mm -mm. But then it gets to a point where an artist is sort of aping or mimicking the activities of a museum through this process of artists as archivist or anthropologist. Mm -mm. And we're always saying the artist as almost anything mm -mm. but an artist now. Mm -mm. And there is something incredibly paradoxical that we're no longer, I don't think, comfortable in many given contexts about letting the artist be an artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe that's just my own reading, but uh, yeah. I think there's something strange. I, 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 I think you're, you're right, but, but I, th I also think that in some cases maybe it's, it goes the, the other way too. No? Uh, artists stopping being artists and, and, and starting to, to develop other fields. I, I, I think that the case of Michael Linares could be interesting in terms that, uh, I mean, when he did the museum, he was also studying uh, a master's in anthropology. No? So his, his own practice was, uh, was being transformed. In, in, and in case he, he decides to continue being an anthropologist or an artist, so that's, uh, I, I think labels, we, we need also to be more flexible with them. No? I, okay. We'll take one more question. Um, just so that everyone knows, we are going to move into a reception at the end of this talk that everyone is welcome to join. Um, it will be uh, in the West Portico, which is the area between the front entrance of the museum and the Knight Plaza. Um, so after our last question, we'll... we'll... Okay, uh, hola Pablo, how are you? Uh, you, mainly, hi. <laughs> you mainly talk about uh, museums. And I, I was wondering how you see the the role of the of the galleries, especially small galleries, in also constructing and pushing more, pushing a little bit more the boundaries between art artists and, and the public. Uh, I was just curious curious about it. I think there's uh, or you get to see. I mean, especially in, in the in the in the region, you you get to see a little bit of everything. No, um, you you see. Uh, I mean, you see artists, um, or, or I guess in my generation still artists would, uh, would do artist-run spaces. And maybe the generation of today, many go directly into becoming uh, gallerists. But also, um, 
they do it in a way in which, um, in which maybe being or having a gallery project becomes a way in which they can have access uh, to other kind of uh, or connections or finding ways into financing a project or going to, uh, to young artists first and connect with others similar minded and many later decide to continue or not to continue, not, not to continue that way. Um, I, th I think that the whole idea of the, of, of the gallery outside of, uh, of the United States and, and, and New York, it's a much more uh, flexible uh, conception, you know? You, you, see, you see sometimes artists that are galleries or, or, or you see galleries that do many of the roles or galleries that don't make money or, or you also see galleries that only sell decoration for the walls, no? So, so you have the, the kind of the two, the two extremes, no? Uh, a, a, gal a gallery which, which is a thinking place and which really, uh, I mean, I, I think, especially now in the, for example, in the case of Puerto Rico, I think that there's a new generation of, uh, of galleries which are more than galleries, but, uh, but through, through trying to find a, a mini market, they support their, their activities and do exhibitions that wouldn't happen uh, if they didn't do them, no, so. Pablo. 